can't imagine how excited I am as an engineer to be able to address this wonderful crowd on cutting edge technologies. But as Secretary General of the United Nations, my concern is to make sure the UN is able to support cutting edge technologies to maximize their positive impacts on people and on the planet, and at the same time to limit the risks of their misuse. And the most fascinating thing about cutting edge technologies is the speed. They move at a warp speed. 90% of the data that exists today in the world was created in the two last years. And to storage one megabyte, one megabyte of data, the cost would be in the 60s, something like one million dollars. The cost is now less than two cents. Things are moving really very quickly. Technologies like uh, blockchain or gene testing are now common technologies. And uh, to the Internet of Things that is moving so exponentially, growing so exponentially, we are now adding the Internet of Bodies with uh, the web connecting medical implants. This is something that is now moving from experimentation to the mainstream. And artificial intelligence is everywhere, helping to buy and sell shares, helping police surveillance, and even helping people to choose their soulmates. I have to say I'm a little bit skeptical about this last possibility, and I'm very happy I have chosen my soulmate by traditional methodologies. <laughs> but. Uh, What is true is that all this is creating enormous benefits for people and for the planet. It helps us cure diseases, fight hunger, and it boosts economic and growth and development all over the world. At the same time, the use of these technologies allows us to be much more effective in addressing the problems of today's world. We have a globalization that has some imbalances and a lot of inequality. And that is why the UN has a blueprint, the Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals, aiming exactly at creating a fair globalization, aiming of better conditions, not leaving anyone behind. Now, those Sustainable Development Goals, from education to health, from uh, rescuing the oceans to climate action. It would be absolutely impossible to achieve them without, uh, I would say, turbo propping the world with the, the fantastic speed of the cutting edge technologies that can help us achieve our objectives. What is also true is that uh, we are in the UN ourselves using those technologies. UNICEF is now being able to uh, map uh, the connections between schools in remote areas. WFP is able to uh, address the problems of the payments, tracking payments to recipients uh, uh, through uh, blockchain. And even the UN High Commissioner for Refugees is able to use these technologies in creating the conditions for refugees with the identification by biotechnologies to be better supported and to be better protected. Now, all these are fantastic things, but there are also challenges and there are also risks. And I'd like to mention very quickly three challenges. First, the social impact of the, third, the fourth industrial revolution. In the next few decades, we will see an enormous amount of jobs created and an enormous job, uh, amount of old jobs destroyed. It's difficult to know which number will be bigger, but those jobs will be very different. And so we will face huge unemployment. You will face disruption in societies with impact in the social cohesion of those societies. And it is clear that we are not prepared for that, and we are not preparing fast enough for that. It is obvious 
that the relationship between work, leisure and other occupations will change dramatically. We will need a massive investment in education, but a different sort of education. What matters now is not, how to, not to learn things, is to learn how to learn things. And uh, we will recognize that many will acquire the skills to allow them to have new professions, but some will be left behind. We will force the need for a new generation of safety nets to allow for people to survive and to have a new meaning for their own lives. This is an area of great concern that needs to mobilize government, civil society, everybody, and we are not doing enough to prepare for this challenge. Second, related to the Internet itself. The Internet is now li uh, linking, as it was said, half of the world population. It has given voice to many people marginalized by history. But the truth is that the Internet is also conveying hate speech. It is used to violate privacy of people. And in some situations, you have governments and other institutions that use it to oppress, for censorship, and to control. Now, it is clear for me that it was not the web that has created populism, that has created tribalism, that has created uh, polarization of societies. These have very deep root causes, and you can't blame the web for that. But it's true the web is amplifying those problems, and we need to mobilize government, civil society, academia, scientists, in order to be able to avoid the digital manipulation of elections, for instance, and to create some filters that are able to block hate speech to move and to be a factor of the instability of societies. And the third concern I would like to raise is related to the question of human agency, the problems of control, and artificial intelligence is at the center of these concerns. Today, we recognize that many things that were done by people are now done by machines. And let's be clear, in many circumstances, they are better done by machines. Even in sophisticated areas like medical diagnosis or in uh, police surveillance. And uh, what is important is not to forget that it also can happen in uh, weapons that will have by their own the possibility to kill. And uh, this is a great concern for me, the impact of technology on warfare and the difficulties created to preserve peace and security in the world. The weaponization of artificial intelligence is a serious danger. And uh, the prospect of uh, machines that have the capacity by themselves to select and destroy targets is creating enormous difficulties, or will create enormous difficulties, to uh, avoid the escalation in conflict and to guarantee that uh, international humanitarian law and human rights law are respected in the battlefields. And for me, there is a message that is very clear. Machines that have the power and the discretion to take human lives are politically unacceptable, are morally repugnant, and should be banned by international law. Now, when we look at all these problems, we understand that we have the need to be able to address them. Typical traditional forms of regulation necessarily do not apply. It is true that in some areas we need to use international law, but they are limited. In the majority of circumstances, technology moves so fast that uh, the time to gather people for a preparation of a convention, to discuss it, to approve it, to ratify and to implement it, when it comes, everything is already very different. And so what we need is to create platforms, like the one that was mentioned in the contract. And I want the UN to be a platform when governments, where governments, the academia, scientists, companies, civil society can come together and can find ways to discuss and to agree 
on protocols, on codes of conduct, on other mechanisms that allow for the cyberspace, that allow for the digital technologies, that allow for the web, that allows for artificial intelligence to be essentially a force for good. Thank you very much.